Chairman. First, I want to thank you for the invitation to come here to the Oxford Union. Tonight is the first night that I've ever had an opportunity to be as near to conservatives as I am. The speaker who preceded me is one of the best excuses that I know to prove our point concerning the necessity sometimes of extremism in defense of liberty, why it is no vice, why moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. I don't say that about him personally, but, uh, <laughs> but that type is the... Uh, He's right. Um, X is not my real name. But if you study history, you'll find why no black man in the Western Hemisphere knows his real name. Some of his ancestors kidnapped our ancestors from Africa and took us into the Western Hemisphere and sold us there. And our names were stripped from us, and so today we don't know who we really are. I'm one of those who admit it, so I just put X up there to keep from wearing his name. And as far as this apartheid charge that he attributed to me is concerned, evidently he has been misinformed. I don't believe in any form of apartheid. I don't believe in any form of segregation. I don't believe in any form of racialism. But at the same time, I don't endorse a person as being ranked just because his skin is white. And oftentimes when you find people like this, I mean that's tight. <laughs> When a, a man whom they have been taught is below them has the nerve or firmness to question some of their philosophy or some of their conclusions, usually they put that label on it, a label that is only designed to project an image which the public will find this face. I'm a Muslim. If there is something wrong with that, then I stand condemned. My religion is Islam. I believe in Allah. I believe in Muhammad as the apostle of Allah. I believe in brotherhood of all men, but I don't believe in brotherhood with anybody who's not ready to practice brotherhood with our people. I don't believe in brotherhood. I just take time to make these few things clear because I find that one of the tricks of the West, and I imagine my good friend, or at least that type is uh, <laughs> from the West, one of the tricks of the West is to use or create images. They create images of a person who doesn't go along with their views, and they make certain that this image is this faithful, and then anything that that person has to say from there on is rejected. And this is a policy that has been practiced pretty much by the West. It perhaps would have been practiced by others had they been in power, but during recent centuries, the West has been in power. They've created the images, and they've used these images quite skillfully and quite successful. That's why today we need a little extremism in order to straighten a very nasty situation out, or a very extremely nasty situation out. <laughs> I think the only way one can really determine whether or not extremism in defense of liberty is justified is not to approach it as an American or a European or an African or an Asian, but as a human being. We look upon it as different Types, immediately we begin to think in terms of extremism being good for one and bad for another, or bad for one and good for another. But if we look upon ourselves as human beings, I doubt that anyone will deny that extremism in defense of liberty, the liberty of any human being, is a vice. Anytime anyone is enslaved or in any way deprived of his liberty, that person is a human being, as far as I'm concerned, he is justified to resort to whatever method necessary to bring about his liberty again. But most people usually think in terms of extremism as something that's relative, related to someone whom they know or something that they've heard of. I don't think they look upon extremism by itself or all alone. They apply it to something. And one of the reasons that it can't be too well understood today Many people who have been in positions of power in the past don't realize that the centers of power are changing. When you're in a position of power for a long time, you get used to using your yardstick, 
and you take it for granted that because you forced your yardstick upon others, that everyone is still using the same yardstick, so that your definition of extremism usually applies to everyone. But nowadays, times are changing, and the center of power is changing. People in the past who weren't in a position to have a yardstick or use a yardstick of their own are using their own yardstick now. You use one and they use another. In the past, when the oppressor had one stick and the oppressed used that same stick, today the oppressed are sort of shaking the shackles and getting yardsticks of their own. So when they say extremism, they don't mean what you do. And when you say extremism, you don't mean what they do. There's entirely two different meanings. And when this is understood, I think you can better understand why those who are using methods of extremism are being driven to them. A good example is the Congo. When the people who are in power want to create an image and to justify something that's bad, they use the press. And they'll use the press to create a humanitarian image for a devil, or a devil image for a humanitarian. They'll take a person who's the victim of the crime and make it appear he's the criminal. And they'll take the criminal and make it appear that he's the victim of the crime. And the Congo situation is one of the best examples that I can cite right now to point this out. The Congo situation is a nasty example of how a country, because it is in power, can take its press and make the world accept something that's absolutely criminal. They take pilots that they say are American trained, and this automatically lends the respectability to them. And then they will call them anti-Castro Cubans, and that's supposed to answer their respectability. <laughs> and, and eliminate the fact that they're dropping bombs on villages where they have no defense whatsoever against such claims. Blowing to death black women, Congolese women, Congolese children, Congolese babies. This is extremism. But it is never referred to as extremism because it is endorsed by the West. It's financed by America, it's made respectable by America, and that kind of extremism is never labeled as extremism, because it's not extremism in defense of liberty. And if it is extremism in defense of liberty, as this text has just pointed out, it's extremism in defense of liberty for the wrong type of people. that kind of extremism, that cold-blooded murder. But the French is used to make that cold-blooded murder appear as an act of humanitarianism. They take it one step farther and get a man named Shonley, who is a murderer. They refer to him as the governor of the, or the prime minister of the Congo to lend respectability to him. He's actually the murderer of the rightful prime minister of the Congo. They never mention that this man... <laughs> I'm not for extremism in the sense of that kind of liberty or that kind of activity. They take this man who's a murderer. The world recognizes him as a murderer. But they make him the prime minister. He becomes a penny murderer, a penny killer, who is propped up by American dollars. And to show the degree to which he is a paid killer, the first thing he does is go to South Africa and hire more killers and bring them into the Congo. They give them the glorious name of mercenary, which means a hired killer, not someone that's killing for some kind of patriotism or some kind of ideal, but a man who is a paid killer, a hired killer. And one of the leaders of them is right from this country here. And he's glorified as a soldier of fortune when he's shooting down little black women and black babies and black children. I'm not for that kind of extremism. I'm for the kind of extremism that those who are destroyed by those bombs and destroyed by those hired killers will risk their lives at any cost. They will sacrifice their lives at any cost against that kind of criminal activity. I'm for the kind of extremism that the freedom fighters in the Stanleyville regime are able to display against these hired killers who are actually using some of my tax dollars that I have to pay up in the United States to finance that operation over there. We're not for that kind of extremism. And again, I think you must point out, one of those who are very much involved as accessories to the crime is the press. Not so much your press, but the American press, which has tricked your press into repeating what they have invented. <laughs> But I was reading in one of the English papers this morning, I think it's a paper called The Express, and uh, it gave a very clear account 
of the type of criminal activity that has been carried on by the mercenaries being paid by a United States tax dollars. It shows where they were killing Congolese, whether they were from the central government or the Stanleyville government. It didn't make any difference to them. They just killed them. <laughs> and uh, they had, had it fixed where those who had been processed had to wear a white bandage around their head. And any Congolese that they saw without that white bandage, they killed them. And this is clearly pointed out in the English papers. If they had printed it last week, there would have been a, an outcry and no one would have allowed the Belgians and the United States and the others who are in cahoots with each other to carry on the criminal activity that exists in the Congo, which I doubt anybody in the world, not even here at Oxford, will accept, not even my friend. Yes. Um, I wonder what, exactly what sort of experience you would consider the uh, killing of uh... I call it the type of extremism that was involved when America dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and killed 80,000 people, or over 80,000 people, both men, women, children, everything. It was an act of war. I call it the same kind of extremism that happened when England dropped bombs on German cities and Germans dropped bombs on English cities. It was an act of war. And the Congo situation is war. When you call it war, then anybody that dies, they die a death that is justified. But those who are in the Spanishville regime, sir, are defending their country. Those who are coming in are inventing their country. And some of the refugees that were questioned on television in this city a couple days ago pointed out that had they not, had the paratroopers not come in, they doubted that they would have been molested. They weren't being molested until the paratroopers came. I don't encourage any act of murder, nor do I glorify in anybody's death. But I do think that when the white public uses its press to magnify the fact that there are the lives of white hostages at stake, they don't say hostages. Every case of their white hostages, they give me the impression that they attach more importance to a white hostage and a white death than they do the death of a human being despite the color of his skin. <laughs> I feel forced to make that point clear, that I'm not for any indiscriminate killing, nor does the death of so many people go by me without creating some kind of emotion. But I think that white people are making the mistake, and if they read their own newspapers, they, they will have to agree that they, in clear-cut language, make a distinction between the type of dying according to the color of the skin. And when you begin to think in terms of death being death, no matter what type of human being it is, then we will all probably be able to sit down as human beings and get rid of this extremism and moderation. But as long as the situation exists as it is, we're going to need some extremism. And I think some of you will need some moderation too. So why would such an act in the Congo, which is so clearly criminal, be condoned? It's condoned primarily because it has been glorified by the press and has been made to look beautiful, and therefore the world automatically sanctions it. This is the role that the best plays. If you study back in history, different wars, whenever a country that's in power wants to step in unjustly and invent someone else's property, they use the press to make it appear that the area that they're about to invade is filled with savages, people who have gone to surf, or they are raping white women, molesting nuns. They use the same old tactic year in and year out. Now, there was a time when the dark world, people with dark skin, would believe anything that they saw in the papers that originated in Europe. But today, no matter what is put in the paper, they stop and look at it two or three times and try and figure out what is the motive of the writer. And usually they can determine what the motive of the writer is. They give the devil an angelic image and give the image of the devil to the one who's really angelic. They make oppression and exploitation and war actually look like an act of humanitarianism. This is not the kind of extremism that I support or that I go along with. I miss a little bit, maybe a little bit. Some days I think about it, but I get over it real quick. It's too late to make amends. We can never be friends. I miss a little bit. I miss that with. I miss that with. I miss that with. One of the reasons that I think it's necessary for me to clarify my own point personally, I was in a conversation with a student here on the campus yesterday, and she told me, well, I'm surprised that you're not what I expected. 
I said, what did, what did you mean? What do you mean? She said, well, I was looking for your horn. So I told her, I have them, but I keep them hidden. Uh, unless uh, someone draws them out. That's my friend, or that type. It takes certain types to draw them out. And uh, this is actually true. Usually, if a person is looked upon as an extremist, anything that person does in your eyesight is extreme. On the other hand, if a person is looked upon as conservative, just about anything they do is conservative. And this comes again through the manipulating of images. They want you to think that a certain area or a certain person or a certain group is involved in actions of extremism. The first thing they do is project that person in the image of an extremist. And then anything that he does from then on is extreme. You know, it doesn't make a difference whether it's right or wrong. As far as you're concerned, if the image is wrong, whatever they do is wrong. And this has been done by the Western press and also by the American press, and it has been picked up by the English press and the European press. Whenever any black man in America shows signs of an uncompromising attitude against the injustices that he experiences then, and shows no tendency whatsoever to be able to compromise with it, then the American press begins to project that person as a radical, an extremist, somebody who's irresponsible, or as a rebel rouser, or someone who doesn't rationalize in dealing with the problem. Um, I want to question you to consider that you have um, projected rather successfully and quite unpleasant image of um, the client. Uh, it depends on which angle. No, let the gentleman bring out his point. Uh, it depends on uh, which angle you look at it, sir. I'm not, I never try and hide what I am. Uh, if, uh, I'm referring to the You're referring to the treat, my treat, of the previous <laughs> <laughs> that as long as a white man does it, it's all right. A black man is supposed to have no feelings. But when a black man strikes a he's an extremist. He's supposed to sit passively and have no feelings, be non-violent, and love his enemy, no matter what kind of attack, be it verbal or otherwise, he's supposed to take it. But if he stands up and in any way tries to defend himself, <laughs> then he's an extremist. No, I think that the speaker who preceded me is getting exactly what he asked for. My reason for believing in extremists, intelligently directed extremists, extremism in defense of liberty, extremism in quest of justice, is because I firmly believe in my heart that the day that the black man takes an uncompromising step and realizes that he's within his right when his own freedom is being jeopardized, to use any means necessary to bring about his freedom or put a halt to that injustice, I don't think he'll be by himself. I live in America where there are only 22 million blacks against probably 160 million whites. One of the reasons that I am in no way reluctant or hesitant to do whatever is necessary to see that black people do something to protect themselves, I honestly believe that the day that they do, many whites will have more respect for them and that there will be more whites on their side than are now on their side with these little wishy-washy love thy hair that they've been using up to now. And if I'm wrong, then you are racial. <laughs> As I said earlier, in my conclusion, I'm a Muslim. I believe in the religion of Islam. I believe in Allah. I believe in Muhammad. I believe in all of the prophets. I believe in fasting, prayer, charity, and that which is incumbent upon a Muslim to fulfill in order to be a Muslim. In April, I was fortunate to make the Hajj to Mecca and went back again in September to try and carry out my religious function and requirements. But at the same time that I believe in that religion, I have to point out I'm also an American Negro. And I live in a society whose social system is based upon the castration of the black man, whose political system is based on castration of the black man, and whose economy is based upon the castration of the black man. A society which in 1964 has more subtle, deceptive, deceitful methods to make the rest of the world think that it's cleaning up its house, while at the same time the same things are happening to us 
1964 that happened in 1954, 1924, and in 1984. They came up with what they call a civil rights bill in 1964, supposedly to solve our problem, and after the bill was signed, three civil rights workers were murdered in cold blood. And the FBI, our head, Hoover, admits that they know who did it. They've known ever since it happened, and they've done nothing about it. Civil rights bill down the drain. No matter how many bills pass, black people in that country, where I'm from, our lives are not worth two cents. And the government has shown its inability, or either its unwillingness, to do whatever is necessary to protect black and property where the black American is concerned. So my contention is that whenever a people come to the conclusion that the government which they have supported proves itself unwilling and, or proves itself unable to protect our lives and protect our property because we have the wrong color skin. We are not human beings unless we ourselves act together and do whatever, however, whenever is necessary to see that our lives and our property is protected. And I doubt that any person in here would refuse to do the same thing were he in the same position. Or I should say, were he in the same condition? <laughs> Just one step farther to see am I justified in this stand. And I say, I'm speaking as a black man from America, which is a racist society. No matter how much you hear us talk about democracy, it's as racist as South Africa or as racist as Portugal or as racist as any other racialist society on this earth. The only difference between it and South Africa, South Africa preaches separation and practices separation. America preaches integration and practices segregation. This is the only difference. They don't practice what they preach. Or as South Africa preaches and practices the same thing. I have more respect for a man who lets me know where he stands, even if he's wrong than the one who comes up like an angel and is nothing but a devil. <laughs> the system of government that America has consists of committees. There are 16 senatorial committees that govern the country and one congressional committee. <clears throat> Ten of the 16 senatorial committees are in the hands of Southern senators who are racialists. This was before the last election. I think it's even more so now. Ten of the 16 committees, senatorial committees, are in the hands of senators who are Southern racialists. Thirteen of the 20 congressional committees were in the hands of Southern congressmen who are racialists. Which means out of the 36 committees that govern the foreign and domestic direction of that government, 23 are in the hands of Southern racialists. Men who in no way believe in the equality of men and men who do anything within their power to see that the black man never gets to the same seat or to the same level that they are on. The reason that these men from that area have this type of power is because America has a seniority system. These who have that seniority have been there longer than anyone else because the black people in the areas where they live can't vote. And it is only because the black man is the prize of his vote that puts these men in positions of power that gives them such influence in the government beyond their actual intellectual or political ability or even beyond the number of people from the areas that they represent. So we, have, we can see in this country that no matter what the federal government professes, the power of the federal government lies in these committees and any time a black man or any kind of legislation is proposed to benefit the black man or give the black man his just due, we find that it's locked up in these committees right here. And when they let something through the committee, usually it is so chopped up and fixed up that by the time it becomes law, it's a law that can't be enforced. Well, another example is the Supreme Court desegregation decision that was handed down in 1954. This is a law. And this law, they have not been able to implement this law in New York City or in Boston, or in Brooklyn, or Chicago, or the North City. And my contention is that any time you have a country, supposedly a democracy, supposedly the land of the free and the home of the brave, and it can't enforce laws, even in the northernmost cosmopolitan and progressive part of it, that will benefit a black man, if those laws can't be enforced, or that law can't be enforced, how much harm do you think we will get when they pass some civil rights legislation which only involves more laws? If they can't enforce this law, they'll never enforce those laws. So my contention is that we are faced with a racialistic society, a society in which they are deceitful, deceptive, 
And the only way we can bring about a change is to talk the kind of language that they understand. The racialist never understands a peaceful language. The racialist never understands the nonviolent language. The racialist, we have you spoken his language to us for 400 years. We have been the victim of his brutality. We are the ones who face his dogs that tear the flesh from our limbs only because we want to enforce the Supreme Court decision. We are the ones who have our skulls crushed, not by the Ku Klux Klan, but by policemen, only because we want to enforce what they call the Supreme Court decision. We are the ones upon whom water hoses are turned with things so hard that it rips the clothes from our back. Not men, but the clothes from the backs of women and children. You've seen it yourself. Only because we want to enforce what they call the law. Well, any time you live in a society supposedly based upon law, and it doesn't enforce its own law because the color of a man's skin happens to be wrong, then I say those people are justified to resort to any means necessary to bring about justice where the government can't give them justice. that when a man is exercising extremism, a human being is exercising extremism in defense of liberty for human beings, it's no vice. And when one is moderate in the pursuit of justice for human beings, I say he's a sinner. And I might add in my conclusion, in fact, America is one of the best examples when you read its history about extremism. Oh, Patrick Henry said liberty or death, that's extreme. Very I read once, passingly, about a man named Shakespeare. I only read about him passingly, but I remember one thing he wrote that kind of moved me. Uh, he put it in the mouth of Hamlet, I think it was, who said, to be or not to be. He was in doubt about something. <laughs> Whether it was nobler in the mind of man to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune moderation, or to take up arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing, end them. And I go for that. If you take up arms, you'll end it. But if you sit around and wait for the one who's in power to make up his mind that he should end it, you'll be waiting a long time. And in my opinion, the young generation of white, black, brown, whatever else there is, you're living at a time of extremism, a time of revolution, a time when there's got to be a change. People in power have misused it. And now there has to be a change and a better world has to be built. And the only way it's going to be built is with extreme methods. And I, for one, will join in with anyone. Don't care what color you are, as long as you want to change this miserable condition that exists on this earth. Thank you.